we could still create a future in 2030, 2040, which is absolutely remarkable. You know, when the UN say we now have 11 years to turn this around so that in 11 years' time we are halfway down, we've halved our emissions and we are firmly on target for zero emissions and we, 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 we have a strategy and we're putting everything in place to get there. If I imagine myself 11 years in the future and we have achieved that, mm. how will I look back over these last 11 years? Mm. You know, I will think that was the most phenomenal time to be alive. Absolutely extraordinary. We got to reimagine everything. Politics changed. Business changed. Education changed. Uh, the way that we lived changed. The way the sense of what felt possible profoundly changed. And obstacles were taken out of the way. And, and companies and organisations who had been the problem before, the support was taken away from them to the extent they couldn't function anymore. And new things came through. And, I, and, and my sense is we are at the beginning of that moment now. It feels to me like the the tectonic plates under our feet are starting finally to shift. And it's partly due to Greta Thunberg and the school strikes and partly due to Extinction Rebellion and partly due to work people have been doing patiently for the last 10, 20, 30 years, partly due to some enlightened politicians. But it feels like things are really starting to shift. And so for me, I always think every conversation about climate change should include the bit that says, but you know what, if we get this together and we do this, it could be absolutely phenomenal. I'm on a train headed towards Totnes in Devon, in the southwest of England. A town known as the birthplace of the transition movement. And I'm going there to meet the founder of that movement, Rob Hopkins. I joined the transition movement in my home country of Sweden last year. But I will admit that I didn't really do my homework on the organization before joining. At first, I didn't know that it existed in other, in other places or that it originated in England or who Rob Hopkins was. So why did I join, you ask? Well, you know when something just feels right. This was a group that seemed to get excited about similar things that I get excited about, like growing your own food, nurturing local culture. They talk about degrowth and regenerative farming and logging practices. Stuff like collaborating with neighbors to make the world friendlier, taking care of bees and butterflies, ideas like working less and spending more time with family, universal basic income, world-changing powerful ideas that are oh so necessary in this mad time of fence building, polarization and exponential growth of shit that we don't need. So it definitely seemed like my kind of organization. But I wanted to know more about it. How did it begin and why? And what kind of cool projects might they be doing in Totnes, the birthplace of it all? Arriving into Totnes. But first, a word from our sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Campfire Stories, a platform for films with the aim to inspire you in the direction of a world we can be proud to hand over to the next generation go to campfire-stories.org to watch the films. It's free and there is no fine print. The films are financed through voluntary donations. You're welcome to give and you're welcome to not. Campfire-stories.org. Check it out. And now, back to today's episode. I step off the train and it's a beautiful day. The sun is shining and everything and everybody seem to be smiling at me. I follow the directions I've been given. Up the hill, turn to the left, past the brewery, turn right in the roundabout. Eventually I find the right door and I give it a knock. Hello. Hi. Well done. Hi. <laughs> Come on in. 
Kids Rock. Is that Ben? Hello, darling one. Hello. 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 Hi. 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 We're going to be in there. Yeah. All right. So I'm so thrilled to be here with Rob Hoskins. Hopkins. Hopkins. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Mm. You're not right. the first person I got in France. I, someone wrote an article recently. They called me Ro uh, Rob Hopskins, oh, right. and I once went to Mallorca where the newspaper called me Bop, right. Bob <laughs> Hoskins. So you're, you're not the first. Right. Well, that, it wasn't a very great beginning to this interview, but hey, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Rob Hopkins, yes, of the transition movement, yeah, slash network, yeah, slash something else perhaps, slash thing, yeah. Um, so, I'd like to ask you, um, this will be a, a bit of a naive interview, I hope you will excuse me, that's okay. but I think it's, that's appropriate because a lot of people in my country, Sweden, are hearing about the transition movement yeah. and the, the omställningsrörelsen, the transition yeah. movement uh, in Sweden is gaining in popularity, Great. but a lot of people don't really know what it is, yeah. uh, and including myself, mm -hmm. uh, but I sort of attached myself to it, like on the vague premise that it seems like it is based on similar values that okay. I hold dear to my heart, like localization and yeah. local currencies and um, yeah, the notion that perhaps we're not separate from nature yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, sustainable living and regenerative mm -hmm. farming and so forth. Yeah. But Yeah, getting away from the vagaries of feeling attacked, like drawn to something. Can you, maybe now from the from the if you excuse the expression, the horse's from, mouth. Yeah, there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> Can I? Yeah. So what is what the is transition? transition? Well, that's a very good question. So, um, so the so the one sentence way I explain what the transition movement is, I say it's a movement of communities who are reimagining and rebuilding the world. So it is a a, a bottom up community led model which uh, recognizes that we are living in a time of the climate emergency and that responding to the climate emergency in a way that our, that our descendants will thank us for rather than resenting us for or possibly not existing because of uh, uh, means going a lot further and a lot deeper than just saying, oh, well, we'll just put solar panels on things and eat organic carrots. You know, it, it, it is a profound... Uh, rethinking of everything that we do and the scale on which we do things so it no longer makes sense for the UK to export the same amount of potatoes to Germany as it imports from Germany or to export to the Netherlands the same amount of butter as it imports from the Netherlands you know we should uh, Herman Daly the economist used to say why don't we just email each other the recipes you know so it's kind of a movement that is based on the idea of just emailing each other the recipes I suppose and seeing that as the opportunity for Uh, an extraordinary kind of reimagining at the local scale. Mm. So that idea that if the one of the main functions of an economy in a place is to enable money to circulate as many times as possible before it leaves and sees that as one of its aims, that's how we build an economy that's resilient and low carbon and that brings people together and is about connection, is about nature connection, is about all of those things. Uh, so, so transition is something which is very solutions focused, very positive, very optimistic. It's very practical. It it is about seeing opportunities and and making them happen. It started here in this little town that you've come to today of, of Totnes in Devon in 2006, and you will now find transition groups in about 50 countries around the world, and about 24 countries now have, like you mentioned in Sweden, a, a, a national what we call a hub, an organisation which is supporting the rollout. It's very self-organising. It's very kind of self-generating. Um, and it has been my sort of life for the last 13 years and has been the most fascinating thing to observe. And one of the, somebody wrote a book about transition, which I've, was really fascinating. And he said, people talk about the transition movement. He said, actually, the most interesting thing about transition is not the movement, it's the moving. He said, you know, it's the way that this idea over the last 10, 12, 15 years has Uh, has evolved and adapted and encountered obstacles and found a way around them and absorbed new influences and responded to the changing climates around it and still sort of kept its shape and, and you know, 
and it kind of evolved in that way. So that's quite a long-winded answer, a way of saying, you know, the, the basically tra- transition is a is is a bottom-up solutions-focused thing that anyone can do anywhere, which uh, is about building community, about building a new economy, about building a new story for the future. And for me, it's really fundamentally rooted in in imagination and and, and imagining something other than what we currently see around us. Mm, thank you. So in my personal life, I've never decided suddenly that I need to do make radical change in my life unless there was a crisis a crisis that midwife that into being yeah um, and I imagine that's the same way it works with political um, swings or, um, or or big events and I'm imagining that's what happened in this town am I or has it always been this kind of a town with new ideas and I th- so Totnes I think is one of about six towns in this country that are kind of laboratory towns so they are towns that have a long history of trying out new things and being quite tolerant of people with odd ideas and being far enough away from London that they have their own kind of an identity so when we started doing transition here we weren't the first thing like that that you know the very first vegetable box scheme in the UK happened here I think the first feminist printing like publishing company was here uh, there was a very experimental school and art school that were based here um, one of the first local currency projects lo- local what's called let's a sort of a forerunner of local currencies took place here so this has this place has quite a long history of being a a place where people kind of try out interesting ideas i guess mm. and it's and it's small enough as well that it's kind of and and over the time it's attracted a lot of cultural creative type of people Mm. and uh it has a a, i I think it's a really fascinating place and um when when i moved here in 2005 just with this idea of doing something kind of like it really was we didn't call it transition at the time but totnes felt like somewhere where we could start telling stories really quickly where actually we wouldn't have to bring everybody up to speed, but would, we could hit the ground running with some good projects and some good stories mm. uh, kind of quite instantly, really. And that's that's kind of what happened. Mm. But actually, you know, I'm not always sure that it's... That, that, that you always need a crisis before people do things, you know. I mean, actually, for me, the first sort of big shift I had in my life when I was 14 was when I became vegetarian and became very interested in politics and stuff and that was because of punk you know actually wait 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 are you telling me that just being 14 isn't a crisis in itself (laughs) (laughs) well it is as well yeah it is as well but you know actually I I feel like I'm sort of part of that generation who for whom school was so awful Mm. that actually we we all like a lot of that sort of post-punk music scene was basically a generation educating itself Mm. and records would have lists of books you should read and uh you know fanzine culture and all of that was really a generation sort of giving itself the education that it didn't get in school Mm. and so that that had a huge impact on me that whole kind of do-it-yourself culture um and uh, and actually i think you know, when we started doing Transition Town Totnes here, yeah, we did frame it in the context of uh, an energy crisis and climate change and things. But we've also always really framed it as we could do something so amazing here. Mm. This is the most enormous opportunity. And actually, even if climate change wasn't a thing, we should do all this stuff anyway because it's great. And actually, it makes us happier and more connected and we feel life feels more delightful when we live in this way than living in the other way. You know. Mm. Can you give a few examples of what you are doing in this community um, successfully that brings yeah. you together and that helps um, mitigate the climate crisis? Yeah. That, so things that can be implemented anywhere. Yeah, for sure. So I always, I sometimes rather cheekily talk about Totnes as being like a Silicon Valley of community resilience, you know, mm. and, and actually, but but when you just come and walk around, you wouldn't really see that much of it. You know, a lot of it is kind of under the radar, it's kind of in, this sort of invisible web of connections that is building. And so, which is why there's a guy, 
who runs transition walks every other Friday and walks around the town and tells you the whole story and you meet some of the people and you get a sense of what's happening. Mm. Um, so some of the key things, I guess, since we started... There's quite a few projects, local food projects you might have seen on the train station. There's food growing on the train station and there's that sort of incredible edible stuff all through the town. We planted uh, edible nut trees, um, nearly 400 uh, now hybrid walnut almond trees in parks and Mm. corners throughout the town. Um, There was a project called Transition Streets, which was a street-by-street behaviour change model, which invited people to get their neighbours together on their street and to meet seven times in each other's houses, looking at water and energy and stuff. That was, yeah, 550 households did that in a town of 8,000 people. And on average, they cut their carbon footprint by about one and a half tonnes. But actually, when they were asked afterwards what they got out of it, no one mentioned the carbon. Mm. All the money they'd saved, everyone talked about how they knew their neighbours better and how they felt more connected and more part of their community. And a lot of those groups carried on and still meet now. And there's a whole new wave of it now of new streets groups forming around that idea. Uh, there is an energy company called the Totnes Renewable Energy Society, which has hundreds of members, which is putting renewable energy projects in place, including a big hydro scheme on the Weir near here, which is an extraordinary project. There's a couple of projects, one of which is an explicitly transition project and one of which has kind of had lots of overlaps I've been involved in it since the beginning uh, called called Atmos and there's another one called Transition Homes and both of those are about building housing that actually meets local need this is a town where there's lots of demand for housing uh, and most of that is is big developers coming in and building houses that no one can afford and people from London move down and buy those houses and local people can't meet any of that so that between them those two projects will build over 100 homes that will be permanently affordable for local need uh, one of them will also include a hotel and a new venue for music and lots of workspaces right next to the train station Hmm. Um, what else there's a brewery that I started with some other people called the New Lion Brewery which is a sort of social enterprise transition brewery in effect you would have passed it yeah so uh, that will be moving in September October to a bigger place and will be becoming a community benefit society so we will basically sell the whole business to the community Mm. so it becomes a community owned business and that is all about exploring really interesting ways of using local ingredients and networking together different local businesses Uh, what else I don't know. There's been about 50 different projects that have come out of this process since it began. Mm. Uh, We've done a couple of big sort of uh, future imagining projects. We did a thing called the Energy Descent Action Plan, which was a sort of a community dreaming of the future we could still create. And we also did something called the Local Economic Blueprint, which mapped where all the money goes in the town. So in terms of food, energy and care, and then looked at how we could do that in such a way that more money stayed locally, which was a really f- sort of formative piece of work, actually. It underpinned a lot of other things that, had ha- that have happened. Uh, there's a project called Caring Town Totnes, where, where Transition Town Totnes, we call it the power to convene, where sometimes a transition group can can get people in a room who would otherwise never get into a room. They can convene discussions and networking that otherwise would never happen. And that's something where we've brought together the 60 or 70 different organisations who provide care in the town Mm. to get them working more closely together in the context of austerity and government cuts, uh, which has led to a whole load of really interesting projects and things as well. We have a thing, place called the Reconomy Centre, which is a sort of an incubator for the new economy here in town. And every year they run my, one of my favourite occasions, which is called the Local Entrepreneur Forum, mm-hmm. where four or five different people with b- ideas for new businesses that fit with a transition ethos will stand up in front of three or four hundred people and say, my name is uh, uh, Rob and I want to start whatever and I need a building and I need £10,000 and I need someone to help me with my business plan or to, uh, you know, whatever. They can be tangible things like money or it can be I need someone to look after my kids while I go and see the bank manager, whatever. Mm. And then people offer their support. I'll give you £1,000 if three other people will. I've got a building you can use. Uh, We just had, it was a couple of weeks ago, this year's one, it was just beautiful. We've now run that for eight years. 
more than 34 businesses now have gone through it. Most of them are still running and every year they all come back. So there's this kind of evolving community and this culture within the town of people going along to identify things they want to support and then investing money, but also investing time and going along as volunteers and really getting involved. Um, yeah, that's some of them. I could keep going, but wow. that's that's quite a few. That's beautiful. I, um, I have this thing where... Um, I, I mean, we we have when we when I say the word intelligence, people tend to think of the brain or refer to the brain. Yeah. But I feel like there's a, a uh, an intelligence in our bodies as well, mm-hmm. and um, one of its features is that it gives you a stomach ache when you're doing something you don't want to be doing. This yes. is something I've noticed in my life. Yes. So I had sure. for for many years. I was I mean from going to school and then doing the things that you were supposed to be doing as a young adult. And School always gave me terrible stomach ache. Yeah, yeah. But then also I was a, a photographer. and But then when I started working professionally, it, it was all cool on the surface. And it's, it was good, made for a good answer at a party. Like, what do you work with? But I, I didn't feel, I was, I couldn't sleep really well yeah. nights before I would go on these photo shoots and so on. Yeah. And so that I've come afterwards to to um to credit my body with a, uh, like a bodily intelligence yeah very good. um with all those things you mentioned i would imagine that this has um affected the people's um uh, working moral is the wrong word here but like the maybe joy of working or or the way they feel about working or would you say yeah that's- I, I i think actually you know, I, w- I wouldn't want to give the impression that this is a town where every single person you'll meet will be like, "Oh, transition is fantastic." You mm-hmm. know, it's still a town. It's still a town like like other towns. And some people think transition is shit. Some people have never heard of it. Mm-hmm. Some people will be like, "Well, I don't, I don't really understand what's the point of it." Mm-hmm. You know, we did a survey in two thousand and eleven that said that 75% of people had heard of it, 66% of people thought it was a good idea, 33% had been to something, had had some interaction with it, and about 2 or 3% of people were kind of actively involved in different mm. parts of it. Um, yeah, I, th- I think when we started it, you know, my mental picture was thinking of it as a as a kind of a linear change process or you do this and then you do that you know but actually i've come to see it over time as and seeing it in other places as well as being a cultural process it's very much like you um like you inoculate soil with a mycorrhizal fungus culture and it runs and sometimes it will run in ways you predict and other times it will run in places you really really couldn't predict at all and I love that sort of um, uh, that ability that transition has to always be surprising mm. and to do things that I don't expect it to do. Um, so yeah, so you know, here certainly there are many people who who would identify transition as um, kind of what they want for the future, and many people have redesigned their lives they probably don't they probably earn less money than they used to Mm. but they don't have that feeling in their stomach that you refer to i kind of think there's also the opposite there's an opposite to that which is um a a a sort of mild euphoria and sort of goosebumps that i get sometimes with projects you Mm. know which is like oh that feels really good you know that's a good (laughs) someone we should do that You know, there's a kind of thing that emerges out of conversations you have when you just happen to bump into the right people, that kind of serendipity that happens when you think, what we need now is somebody who could, hello, I can, you know, and then and there's quite a lot of that as well. You know, so so there's a lot of people, I think, for whom for whom transition has been a very um, uh, an opportunity to really profoundly kind of rethink their lives. You know, I meet a lot of people who say I was doing something and I was really miserable and then I got involved in transition and then, it, and, and then I've been able to really rethink and reimagine and, uh, and now I'm doing this and I'm so much happier. <clears throat> Not many people say I'm so much richer than I used to be, but a lot of the time well, they say I'm so much happier. You know? Well, you have to <laughs> um, define rich. Well, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and I think as a as as a community, it's the same. You know, there's lots of 
Um, uh, what I see is 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 the culture, or like, is is the story that the town tells about itself mm. changing to a degree where all kinds of new things start to become possible. You know, there's something really interesting for me in it that actually in our culture we have this belief that if you want to change anything, you have to be a real control freak and you have to be really, you have to boss people about and you have to be powerful kind of alpha male, alpha female person who can, you know, you do this and you do that. And, and actually it's felt to me like the process in Tottenham. So yes, of course, it's needed people who can pick things up and do them and make them happen. But the overall process has had an enormous amount of trust designed into it mm. and an enormous amount of belief in the ability of people to do brilliant things when they're trusted to do so. You know, And I've seen that over and over. to that to the the goosebumps and the stomach yeah ache. what a great way like that's what we should teach our children if it feel if you have a stomach ache don't do it stop <laughs> doing it immediately and if you feel tingly and goosebumps then that's a sign that maybe you should follow that mm. whatever that i think that would i think that's very good they never taught me that in my school right yeah and i spent most yeah. of my school with stomach ache i think uh, <laughs> same yeah. here at least yeah. high school that's where it came together Yeah, you know, which is which for me is one of the things I love so much about the school strikes. Yeah, the climate, school strikes for climate. You know, it's it's such a it's such a powerful kind of a refusal to have a stomach ache. Yeah, I'm not all right with this stomach ache anymore. Yeah. I'm not I'm not accepting it. And it's having real tangible oh, impact. Extraordinary. And I can tell you, I have one example. It's myself. I. Um, I wanted to come to England by train and I looked it up and, and it was possible but it took a long time and it was expensive and then I looked up how much a, a plane ticket would be and uh, it was a fraction of the cost and it was an hour and a half as opposed to a day and a half yeah, yeah. so I had decided I couldn't really afford to take the, the train uh, and then there was uh, one of those um, Fridays for Future uh, what do you call it? Marches. Yeah, marches, yeah, gatherings, yeah. And there was a, a, a photograph that I saw on Facebook or somewhere of a boy, young boy holding a sign saying, how can you fly, silly adults, or some, something <laughs> like that. And it was so disarming, and it just was like, all right, that sign is for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for many people, but... That, Good. I, so I went and made the train reservation, even though I couldn't really afford it. Fabulous. And uh, so this trip is now a week long instead of three days. Great. And it's giving me time to, to meet you and to mm. do other things. And, and uh, I've been yeah. the other way. I've been to when I went to Sweden. I went to Sweden on the train. Mm. Takes a while. Takes a while, but mm. but you know, actually, when I'm on the train going to Sweden, I read, I write, I do some of my best writing, and there is there are no distractions. Right. I can read. I can look out the window. Yeah. Write articles. I love it. It slows down time a little bit. It slows down time, and that's a good thing. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I don't fly. I gave up flying in 2006. So, you know, most of the movement that you see, the, the, the transition movement has been supported with videos and mm. online talks. And mm. it felt, you know, it felt so important to to live that, you mm. know, as a, as, a, as a practice. Yeah. Um, all right, a couple more questions. Maybe we have time for Yeah, yeah. Um, so I... In the individualized society that we live, we're told that we need to do things to quote unquote save the planet. And I do my best. I eat mainly vegetarian food. I don't fly as much as we spoke about. And I try to get used to bike and recycle all my garbage and so forth. Um, do you? I figure you maybe you're like professional at this a little bit. Like maybe one more level or two more levels. What are some other things that I can do? in my ordinary like day-to-day -day life to I hate that expression save the 
Save the planet. Save the planet. <laughs> like the planet needs but, us to yeah. save it. But you know what I mean. Like yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I would always say to start a garden, to grow some food, grow something. Uh, I would say if you have enough space to just leave some of it and just let it go wild and just observe it, have a have a part have have some place where you go to observe how nature heals itself, and to kind of document that process is just extraordinary. That kind of rewilding uh, approach, even if it's just a corner of the garden, you know, it's fascinating to watch and observe that process. Um, uh i would say to try and eat seasonal food local food to uh look at to try and do everything you can you know if you if you own a house it's easier to to try and do whatever you can to reduce the amount of energy that you use um i guess i guess like you say you know eating less meat eating less dairy product and flying less are the are kind of the two main things I think you can do. Mm. You know, we we need to get down to having a carbon footprint of next to zero by twenty thirty. And if I fly to New York and back, that's like four tons. You know, so it's it's completely incompatible. Flying really has no. Uh, it's you know, in the kind of affluent West, we've come to assume that we have some kind of inherent right to fly whenever we just because we can buy the tickets online. But, you know, there's like 70-something percent of the world will never, ever set foot on an aeroplane. Mm. It's a complete privilege, the idea that we can hop on an aeroplane and go to places. So I think one of them, the things for me is I realise, you know, I know parts of Delhi better than I know Dorset or North Devon or places around here. You know, so there is something as well about really learning about the place where we live. Where are the rivers that flow through the places where we live? What are the species that are indigenous to the places where we live? What are the do we can we identify all the trees that are growing in the place where we live? So there's a kind of a coming home to where we live process that I think is really important to this. Um, and you know, transition wise, I think there is something about. Uh, getting to know your neighbours and finding opportunities to connect with the people around us and to find common ground with the people around us, which is one of the most important things we can be doing, particularly politically now, I think, is is uh, where there are so many people who want to divide everybody and have the kind of the politics of divi- those toxic politics of division. You know, to find places and where we can enable people to have conversations is really important. Um and I guess as well, there's something about if we have, you know, the the yes, we can we can look and we can say the government needs to do this and the government needs this climate policy and that climate policy. But we also, in effect, shape climate policy every time we go shopping. Every time we open our wallet, we are shaping the kind of future that we want to see. So we so you know to to support the local when we see local businesses. Who, who represent the f- kind of future that we'd like to create, then get behind them, back them, support them, invest in them, volunteer for them, you know, get involved. You know, there is a new economy that is emerging uh, in terms of food and energy and, and these kind of local economies are emerging all over the place, but they're really fragile and they will only exist when I go to places with local currency. I say, this is a beautiful, you have a great, you have a local currency here. But it'll, it'll, it's only going to, it's not going to exist by magic. It's not going to, you know, it'll only exist if you use it and you make it part of your everyday life. And you can say the same for local food, for community energy, for all of these things. You know, we can, um, you know, we have a very, very small window to turn this around. So I, I, so the other thing I would say to people in, in, in that sense is um, there's, there's an amazing movement in France now, or I can't remember what it's called, where where pe- people are offering to give up work for six months in order to campaign and lobby for uh, for the French elections that are coming up in the early next year. Mm. So to try and get kind of transition ideas, low carbon ideas uh, accepted across the political spectrum mm. uh, for that election, you know, and I that's a really nice idea that you know that idea of enabling other people or enabling yourself to have time to really dedicate to this you know so i feel like you know i do the work that i do and it enables my wife to 
kind of volunteer for Extinction Rebellion pretty much full time. You know, and I think there's something, you know, we need to free people up to really be putting their time and energy into this. And then just the last thing I would say, because it, it comes out of a book that I'm just finishing writing at the moment, is I think we need to use any all the conversations that we have with people, with neighbours and friends and family, where we're talking about climate change and, and particularly, I think, with young people. Any conversation we have where we're talking about climate change and so on, we need to weave into all of those conversations some st storytelling about the future that we could still create because I feel so heartbroken when I go on the school strikes and the kids have internalised this kind of uh, it's too late, we're fucked it's all awful uh, you know, you've destroyed the world and all that, you know actually, it is still possible only just but it is possible mm. that we could still create a future in 2030 2040 which is absolutely remarkable you know it, the, when the when the un say we now have 11 years to turn this around so that in 11 years time we are halfway down we've halved our emissions and we are firmly on target for zero emissions and we we we, we have a strategy and we're putting everything in place to get there when i hear that the question that brings up for me is if I imagine myself 11 years in the future and we have achieved that, mm. how will I look back over these last 11 years? Mm. You know, I will think that was the most phenomenal time to be alive. Absolutely extraordinary. We got to reimagine everything. Politics changed, business changed, education changed, the way that... Uh, uh, the way that we lived changed, the way the sense of what felt possible profoundly changed and obstacles were taken out of the way and, and companies and organisations who had been the problem before had the, the support was taken away from them to the extent they couldn't function anymore and new things came through and, I, and, and my sense is we are at the beginning of that moment now. It feels to me like the the tectonic plates under our feet are starting finally to shift. And it's partly due to Greta Thunberg and the school strikes and partly due to Extinction Rebellion and partly due to work people have been doing patiently for the last 10, 20, 30 years, partly due to some enlightened politicians. But it feels like things are really starting to shift. And so for me, I always think every conversation about climate change should include the bit that says, but you know what, if we get this together and we do this, it could be absolutely phenomenal mm. you know i didn't live during the time of the suffragettes when the suffragettes changed lives for women and what women felt was possible i didn't live through the time of the sort of stonewall lgbt uh, movements that that, that that bought equality and, and rights for, for for lgbt people i didn't live through the time of the civil rights movement when martin luther king walked over selma bridge but i'm living in the climate emergency in 2019 mm. and actually i feel like if we if we're able to do this it will just be the most extraordinary time so i always try and weave in those stories about what would it be like to wake up what would a day in the life be like then what would we see what would we do what would our what would it smell like what would it sound like and i think we always need to be having those conversations alongside all the other ones The music in this episode comes from Anton Pettersson of the Swedish Transition Movement. Check out more of his music at Spotify or SoundCloud. Anton Pettersson, that is spelled A-N-T-O-N-P-E-T-T-E-R-S-S-O-N. -S -S this show has been brought to you by the Campfire Podcast sibling, the film platform Campfire Stories. With films that are disconnected from the mainstream, but in tune with the zeitgeist. Campfire-stories.org. See you there. <laughs>